And a good morning to you. April showers bring Mayflowers. What does what do Mayflowers bring? Pilgrims. There you go. Wonderful. Somebody's awake. No complaining. This is a no complaining service. We need the rain. So I told the Lord, let it pour, be merciful, but let it pour. So in recognition of the maker of the rain and the maker of the wind, I thought we would begin by saying, thank you, Lord, for the rain. So on the count of three, we're going to say, thank you, Lord, for the rain. Here we go. One, two, three. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. We reckon him to be our great creator. As the rain has come down, I trust that heaven has come down and glory has filled your soul. 510, let's stand, let's sing with the joy of the Lord in our soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day I have to never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, the Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy and telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole My sins were washed away And my night was turned to day Heaven came down and glory filled my soul Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine Justified fully through Calvary's love Oh, what a standing is mine And the transaction so quickly was made When as a sinner I came Took of the offer of grace He did proffer He saved me, oh, praise His dear name Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now of a hope that will surely endure After the passing of time I have a future in heaven for sure There on those mansions of lime And it's because of that wonderful day When at the cross I believe Reaches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen. Let us pray. Dearly Father, we thank you so much that indeed, just like the song says, you have purchased and redeemed us, Lord. Father, it's such a humbling thought as the hymnist wrote that you have, because of your son's sacrifice, we can have a relationship with you. And it is because of that that we can gather this morning and rejoice in the fact that these showers are upon us. But Lord, we praise your name that you have purchased us and you have made the transaction complete. 
And Lord, it is such a gift that anyone can receive. I pray that if there would be someone here today that has not received your gift of eternal life, that today would be that day of salvation. Father, meet with us in a great way. Allow your spirit to move freely and allow pastor to speak with power of what you have in store for each believer. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please turn around and greet those around you. That is what I want to do as you come back, page 146. Great little chorus, a worship chorus. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. This is what he wanted to do. I trust this is what you want to do this morning. Lift your voice now, 146. I worship you. is not like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. worship you. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Amen. You may be seated. I trust that's the desire of your heart this morning as the people of God to worship our great God and our great Savior. There is none like him. So good to see you this morning. I, I love you for being in church today. You had every reason in the world to stay home today. And I know you did. And many of you battled hard rain to get here. Some have texted and just said it's just impossible for them to make it. They're watching online. So good to have you. Um, I, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, let it rain, but be merciful to us. And he's watching over us in a wonderful way. If you're visiting with us and you first time, God bless you. Thank you so much. And the pew in front of you is a connection card. If you'd be so kind as to reach out, grab that card, fill it out, put it in the offering plate when it goes by. If you miss the plate, drop it off at the Welcome Center in the lobby on your way out. We'd love to greet you face to face. And we're delighted to have you in our service. Don't forget our service tonight at 6 o'clock. Preaching on faith tonight. What is faith? How it's appropriated in our life. The importance of it. I do believe that man was created with six senses. Pastor, we have five senses they taught us in school. I think we were created with six. I think you develop a sixth sense once you come to know the Lord. And I'll preach to you a little bit about that tonight. Those of us that know it, we will rejoice in it and see how God uses that in our lives. 
Uh, don't forget Tuesday night, we have the American Heritage Girls. Of course, Wednesday night, Bible study men. This Saturday is our men's conference. I'm asking every man to be there. At least give whatever part of the day you can give. I know it costs $25. It'll be the best $25 that you have invested in your spiritual life in a long time. The three messages that Dr. Messer will preach deal with a man and his influence. Um, the, the, the work of the influencing of the Holy Spirit of God in our own lives. The present ministry of influence. And then a legacy of influence that we trust that we as men will leave to our families and within our church and within those uh, areas of ministry that God has given to us. Do not discount this, men. It's, uh, your grass being cut is not more important than this. Anything else is not more important. If you can at all make it, please sign up at the welcome desk. Uh, we got about five or six other churches, men that are coming from other churches as well. And it, it will really be a tremendous time. It goes from 9 o'clock till 2 o'clock, so it's not the whole day. And you'll be able to get home and finish up as in the evening anything that you have to prepare yourself for the Lord's Day and, of course, for Monday. Um, as you make your way through the announcements, I wanted to just touch on, too, don't forget the Awana Grand Prix on May 9th. And those of you that have young people in the Awana program, this is to let mom and dad know that they'll, they'll be working on their cars then, of course, Mother's Day is May 13th. We have breakfast that day from 9 to 10.15. One service on Mother's Day at 10.30. Uh, breakfast will be any time between 9 and 10.15. Schedule yourself accordingly. Also, around the, uh, uh, from my understanding, around the building, we're going to have opportunities set up for you to get your picture taken with mom. I believe that uh, there will be a gift that will help for, with you with that and all kinds of fun things. It's a sweet day on Mother's Day, and so I trust that we'll be ready to, to encourage that. Don't forget the tickets for the breakfast. They're on sale at the welcome desk. It's $3 a person, $10 for a family of four or more. I'm not sure what we're having, but I've never eaten anything that's not good in all of my life here. It will be good. I promise you there. I'll get the menu, put it in the bulletin for you as we come together. Uh, speaking of coming together, uh, I was in, uh, uh, let's see, where were we? Umatilla, Florida yesterday. Turner Hansen did get married he, and to Alicia, and so now she's Alicia Hansen. Pray for them. They're getting on a plane, I think right now, headed to Costa Rica for a honeymoon. I, I, that's a pretty good honeymoon, yeah, amen? And uh, Turner what looked like a deer in headlights yesterday, but... Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think the boy stopped smiling for hours, man. I mean, Alicia was stunning. Every bride is stunning. She was stunning. And those of you that made the trip, God bless you. Thank you for going up there. Keep them in your prayers that God would just be merciful and care for them and protect them in a wonderful way. Take your hymn book. I know the choir is going to sing, but take your hymn book. Find page number 611. You're not going to sing. The choir is going to sing. And they're doing a song entitled, He Hideth My Soul. It's a rendition of this hymn. And um, I just wanted to draw your attention to this and so that you'd be able to follow the words as they're singing. I want you to notice that down at the bottom in the left-hand corner, you see two words, text and music. Text, you have a name there, Fanny J. Crosby. We know Fanny Crosby to be one of the, if not the greatest hymn writer that has ever been on the earth. You know her to suffer from physical blindness. So here's what I want you to understand. A physically blind woman wrote this hymn, but she was filled with spiritual sight. And so as you listen to the choir sing, somewhere in this thing, just close your eyes real tight and just think about being blind and think about not being able with physical sight. And think about the power of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ability to minister to our, our need. It, it will bless you. God bless you, choir, as you lift your voice.
Thank you, choir. Powerful, wonderful. Page 718. I want you to give me a minute to introduce the hymn. And I want to, I want to communicate something that I know you're going to agree with. I just want you to hang in there with me till the end. I, I, we have a lot of people that visit our church all the time. Thousands of people visit our church during, during the course of a year. And most of the time when somebody visits our church, probably 95% of the time, it's just a, a, a positive experience for them. They, they give just a, a, a joyous compliment. If there's one unifying dissent that I hear, and it's, it will be about the music. And what, what they do is they come in and they'll say something like, I like you. Speaking of the pastor, that's my favorite. <laughs> and they'll say, we, we had a, a wonderful experience they would, and then they'll follow that up by saying, but if we could just make one suggestion about the music. And then what they'll say is they'll say something like, we, 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 we miss the, the contemporary part of the music. And so they come, and it's, it's funny because they don't understand. They're blessed when they're here and they sense something here they don't sense maybe in other places. And they don't understand that what, the reason we have what we have in large part is due to the music that we sing, to the hymns. And, and they, they don't understand the truth and the doctrine that's in the hymn. So here's what happens to Pastor Hunter, Right? People come, and they come, and they visit, and then they disappear. And then, and then they, don't, they, they don't come to church. They may go a, a different direction. But I find that when they're hurt and when they're broken and when the life comes crumbling down, all of a sudden I look up, and they're sitting in Plantation Baptist Church. And... And all of a sudden, I see as we sing, tears begin just to roll down their cheeks. I was speaking with some people this week, and they, they wanted my help and counsel and direction, but they don't, we, we don't come because of the, the, the hymns. And I thought, hmm. So I was very kind, and I just said this to them. I said, let me ask you a question. How is that contemporary approach working for you right now? Everything you know is crumbling to the ground. And their life is crashing and their marriage is done. Their children are done. They, they, they have nothing. And yet they miss the, this experience in the, in, the, in the emotional part, but, but they don't have the support of the foundation part of the word of God. When you need a, a song to hang on to, I find that most of them come from within this book. Oh, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. One of those great songs that I hold on to during the week many times is 718. It's a song that talks about the moments of my life and the moments of your life. And the song says day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly as part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. Oh, there's the moments in our lives, church, when, yeah, you use different styles of music and different types of music, and, and they fit the moments. But I think when we corporately come together and worship the Lord, 
Nothing fits the moment like these hymns that stay with us every moment of our lives. You stay concentrated in this hymn and you notch you out one statement that you can hold on to today and I promise you, you'll have met with God. Stand if you would please. Sing the song. Let it minister to you day by day. Day by day and with its passing moments strength I find to meet my trials here trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear He whose heart is kind beyond all Gives unto each day what he deems best. Loving me is part of pain and pleasure. Mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me. With a special mercy for a child All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me He whose name is Counselor and Power The protection of his child and treasure Is a charge that on himself he as your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose that faith consolation offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take us from our Father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I Pray with me, please. We'll have our offering. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for your presence, your continual presence in our lives through the Holy Spirit of God. As he inhabits us, those of us that are saved. Thank you for your promised presence when two or three are gathered together in your midst. It's the body of Christ. We reckon your presence in our room today. Father, we have much to be grateful for. We have our eternal salvation to be grateful for. We have all that this hymn talks about in your faithful presence, your faithful love, your faithful moving. And you sing those first two songs and you can understand, what, or the first two verses, and you can understand why the cry for help comes from the author. Help me then in every trial, tribulation, that I would trust your promises, that I would lose not face, sweet consolation. Oh God, what a great truth there. I pray today for anyone that's in the midst of a test or a trial or a tribulation. I pray today that they would reckon that just because they're in the midst of that does not mean that somehow God has failed or his word is not true. I trust they would receive from the hymn the encouragement to stay, stand, trust, continue, oh, the Father's wise bestowment, for he himself has laid the pledge to protect his child and his treasure. Oh, man, that makes me want to shout, thank you, God. You laid on yourself the pledge. Wow, thank you. 
to know that I'm your child and I'm your treasure. Father, I, I pray you'd help me preach today with the power of the Spirit of God. I know where we're headed. I know how the service will end as far as I believe the leadership of the Spirit of God. Forever change us. Forever open our eyes. And Lord, as we leave here today, may we leave here humbly submitted to you in our life and that we would be, as Rod's going to sing, all that you would enable us to be. Bless the offering. Receive it for your glory. I praise you for the rain today. I praise you for the good hand of God upon us. Thank you, God, for watering us. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. So others may see the beauty and presence of your love In one who was blind but now believes Be here in my heart, flow through my blood Strengthen my soul and wash me clean A living example of what your grace has done I will walk beside you I give you my life And when others seek to find you May I be the light that shines Be here in my hands Give me your touch Use me to comfort and to build Shelter for those who need your love to my lips so I may speak echo your truth and living words Lord make me all that I can be I will walk beside you Jesus I give you my life and when others seek to find you, may I be the light that shines. Be here in my heart, flow through my blood, strengthen my soul and wash me clean. Lord, make me all that I can be. Lord, please make me all that I can be. Thank you, Brother Rod. I'll tell you again, like I told you in the first service, I'm going to need that song again in 30 minutes. We weren't, 
we weren't really prepared and it blessed our socks off of us. Wait till I preach you to be prepared. Normally, Brother Rod goes home right now, but I've asked him to stay. Because when you hear this song a second time in 30 minutes, I want it to forever change your life. Please find, if you would, the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter number 10. While you're finding the book of Revelation chapter 10, which your Bible should almost open to already with the book of Revelation, find, if you would, Daniel chapter number 12, Revelation chapter number 10, Daniel chapter number 12. I want to preach to you this morning from this 10th chapter. It's not a long chapter. Don't get excited. That doesn't translate for a short message. (laughs) Just kidding you. But I do believe it's very powerful and very pertinent to our life and our life as a church. Verse number one, if you would. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. A rainbow was upon his head and his face was as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. What a description. He had in his hand a, would you say those two words, please? Little book. Underline it. So important. So important. The whole chapter is about the little book. He had in his hand a little book. Notice it's open. He set his right foot upon the sea, his left foot upon the earth or upon the land. He cried with a loud voice as when a lion Roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, John says. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth. Lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever. I have that phrase underlined in my Bible. I would encourage you to do it as well. Who created heaven, the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be, say those three words please, Time no longer. Highlight, circle, underline. What an announcement. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, I'll show it to you, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. I have that underlined as well. As he hath declared to his servants, the prophets, The voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and I said unto him, Give me the little book. He said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as I had eaten it my belly was bitter and he said unto me thou must prophesy again before many peoples nations tongues and kings and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word where are we pastor Take your ink pen once again and put a parenthesis around the words chapter 10. You did this earlier in chapter number 7, the heading to the chapter. We find ourselves entering now into the 10th chapter, a parenthetical part of the book of Revelation. It will go for about four chapters. 
Where do we find ourselves in the timeline of the book of Revelation? We're making our way now to about the middle of the week, almost to that changing moment there where the Antichrist is ready to be indwelt by the, uh, by, the, by the Satan himself, where there's about to be the entrance and the abomination of desolation, what Daniel is talking about. Remember, we began a journey back in chapter number six with the seven seals that were to be opened up in the beginning of this tribulation period. We know that we're talking about this seven-year period after the rapture of the church. We're talking about a time when God is taking vengeance upon the earth in judgment against unrighteousness. We're talking about that seven-year period of time that is preparing the earth and ready to receive the millennial kingdom of Christ that will be coming. We understand that as these seals were unfolded and opened from that book that we read six of them, bam, 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 in succession. And then all of a sudden, before the seventh seal, God gave us a parenthesis, a chapter to breathe, a chapter to rejoice, a chapter to celebrate for our God is great and he's greatly to be praised. And our God is a God of salvation. Not only in our life, but he will be throughout the tribulation period. I don't know about you, but I thank God that I'm saved. And there will be others in the tribulation period that will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. After chapter number seven, and we got that glimpse, then in chapter number eight, the seventh seal was opened. The seventh seal would be like a firecracker, the Bible scholars kind of write about. Sometimes you go and you watch fireworks, and one firework will shoot up in the air, and it will explode, and then out of that comes another one that explodes and unfolds. Well, the seventh seal had within it, has within it, the seven trumpets of God that the angels will be blowing upon the earth. Last week, I preached to you six of those trumpets as we saw what would be unfolding. And the, and the reality of that or the purpose of that was to bring the earth and all of the inhabitants of the earth to the point where there would be an allegiance behind one man. There needs to be an allegiance behind one man for God to finish his work of judgment upon the earth. And so as we saw those first four trumpets unfold and we had hail and lightning and we had the waters being uh, touched and we had the skies moving and then that fifth trumpet you remember that angel opened up that bottomless pit and those demonic disembodied spirits came out of there and they they possessed men they were not allowed to kill men but they possessed men for five months upon the earth we know that as that as they did that that mankind and humanity so possessed and so tormented would seek death and the bible said at that time they won't be able to find death upon the earth the sixth trumpet blew and we know and there was the calling of those spirits out of that river euphrates those four demons they were they you can find them in the old testament in daniel chapter number 10 they've always been there hindering the work of god they've always been there trying to destroy the nation of israel those four demons come out of that river and they lead a worldwide Wide war that will take place. The Bible says, or Bible scholars tell us, that by the time you get done with the sixth trumpet, at this point in time, half of the world's population is gone since from the time that we know it right here and there. And so we understand that that war that takes place, many Bible scholars believe it will involve Russia, it will involve China, it will involve the Muslim and the Islam culture there. Pastor, will America be? Most of the Bible scholars feel like the Antichrist will very easily with those 10, tri those 10 nations eliminate the United States of America. Most Bible scholars that you read now refer to us being gone away very simply because of the debt that we owe. I don't know that to be true. It sounds biblically true for the Bible says the borrower is servant to the lender. Somehow we go away and we don't have much to say about it. Or we come under, under, under authority on that prior. I don't care. I won't be here. I do care because I love my nation. But we find ourselves at that sixth trumpet at that point in time. As you come to the end of chapter number nine, you sense the entrenchment 
of evil upon the earth. Look, if you would, at verse number 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship the devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, of their sorceries, which are drugs, or of their fornication, nor of their thefts. And so you understand that lines have been drawn. Following that sixth trumpet, God nestles out once again a parenthesis. Now let me tell you what a parenthesis is about in the book of Revelation. Here's what it does not do. It does not advance the narrative. All that it does is helps fill in what is happening behind the scenes, what is happening, what God is doing, and what Satan is doing, and how that is unfolding, and how God is using these things. So we'll need that when we get to chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. And so we find ourselves in this parentheses. Pastor, are the parentheses important? My friend, every word in the Bible is important. Okay. So we need to understand what happens. John gets a vision, very famous vision in the Bible colleges, preacher boy classrooms, students of the Bibles, Bible studies, churches, studies about the revelation. Who is this angel? Who, what is this little book that he's holding in his hands? Why does the little book, as John asked to eat the little book, why is the little book sweet in John's mouth, but as soon as he swallows it, his stomach is bitter? What is being communicated here, pastor, for our understanding? Oh, my goodness, is there for our understanding? When John sees the angel, he begins to describe him as another mighty angel. There's a description of him in verse number one. He's clothed with a cloud, a rainbow's upon his head. You've heard some of these words before as John has seen what goes on around the throne of God in heaven. His face was as it were the sun, his feet as the pillars of fire. Notice if you would in verse number three, when he cries with his voice, it's like the sound of a lion roaring. Matter of fact, the response is so strong back that seven thunders utter their voices in response. We see that the angel that John is seeing descends down and he takes one foot and puts it on the land and another foot and he puts it on the sea. So John sees him there strong. He sees them there beautiful. He sees them there descriptive. He sees him with one foot on the land, one foot on the water. And John notices in one hand he's got a little book. He notices also, if you would please, look at verse number five, that the other hand is lifted up to heaven. John then hears the angel voice. Verse number six, the angels swear by him that liveth forever and ever. He goes on to add to the description of who he's swearing to that this one that liveth forever and ever is also the one that created everything. Hold your hand here. Go back to chapter number one. Come on, you'll love this. You should know this. It should be going through your mind right now. Matter of the fact, you, you should be able to find the verse without me even telling you. Pastor, that's unfair. Verse number 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that, say it, liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive, how long, class? Forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. Who is this angel? I don't know. I know this is what Bible scholars tell us. Some believe it's Gabriel. Some believe him to be an angel. Some believe it to be the person of Christ 
themselves, Christ himself, based on the description. I, I'm not necessarily so sure that I'm going to, remember we talked about sensationalism here. I'm not going to go down that path, but I do know a couple of things about the angel that I can preach to you. I know that whether he be Gabriel or whether he be the Lord Jesus, he comes with the, uh, with the enablement of all authority. If it's Gabriel, then he swears by him that liveth forever and ever, and that person is Jesus Christ. If it is Christ himself, then he has the ability for all authority has been given unto the Lord Jesus. What you need to know about the strong angel is the authority that he brings. And when he brings his authority, he puts one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. Think about what is going on. The land is convulsing because of the work of God. Not only what God's direct hand is doing, but what he's doing through demonic work that God is controlling. Billions are gone. The sky has has changed. The land is in upheaval. Not only is the land in upheaval, but the sea is in upheaval. One third of the creatures have already been killed. The ships have been destroyed. I don't know if you've ever been on the ocean when it's in upheaval, when those waves are crashing in, but my friend, it is terrifying to be on the water when it's in upheaval. To these two events, comes the strong angel and puts his feet on each one of them, symbolizing that there is no authority greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no power greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that there is convulsion on the land and the sea is evident that it is Christ that is in controlling that. Oh, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar that thou mayest know that there is a God in heaven. I submit to you that God that sits in heaven, that sits on that throne, is the God that sits on the throne of my heart. His name is Jesus Christ. And the Bible goes on to say that, to testify that he's also the great creator of all things. This is why evolution is a sin. It's a sin. Pastor, I believe in evolution that denies the deity of Jesus Christ. You cannot believe in evolution and, and, and not deny the deity of Christ. Well, I believe that God can use evolution. Yeah, God can use anything he wants, but God said that he did not use evolution and he created it with his voice. Your pastor is preaching to you the truth. You better not let evolution get a hold in your home. You better not believe it. It is against the Bible. You let your children believe in that. You are letting them go in a direction against the word of God. When it all comes crashing down, the authority of God will be revealed in the one who created the world. Well, I just believe the world happened. Then you deny Jesus. Well, I don't believe that, that Jesus created, then you deny that. Well, I believe in, that denies the authority of the Bible. You're welcome. I don't get paid for that one, but, but God told me to say it. By the way, I didn't say that at 8.30, so somebody out here is an evolutionist. That's how I look at that. You need to repent of that. Let me pause and say something else. Thank God for the school ministry we have in our church. Mom and dad, you can have your kid in a public school. Good people in a public school. Great people in a public school. But our nation has chosen an education in a public direction that denies the deity of Jesus Christ as God the creator. I am telling you as your pastor, you better not neglect that in your kid. Ask your kid if he's an evolutionist. The authority is so important in this moment because an announcement's coming. If you look at verse number six, the announcement that the angel makes is that there's time no longer. Pastor, does that mean that there will be no more time at that point as far as hours and minutes? No, that's not what it means. Here's what it means. There's no more delay. When the angel shows up, 
and he steps down and he makes this announcement to John. The announcement is that there is no longer going to be a delay. A delay, pastor? A delay in what? Oh, I was hoping you would be curious. Look, if you would, at verse number seven. But in the days of the voice of the, say those two words. Okay, now take your hand and flip your Bible page just to chapter number 11. And look, if you would, at verse number 15. Let the Bible commentate on the Bible. And the, say those two words, seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the people of God should say, amen. That's the millennial kingdom of Christ. When the seven trumpet blows, it is announcing that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of Christ. And it's always been prophesied that way. You go back to Daniel and that statue, that stone not made with hands comes out of the sky, smashes that foot in the kingdom kingdoms of the world temper down to the ground. Oh, listen, we're on the winning side, baby. We're on the winning side. The angel shows up and says, no more delay from the sixth trumpet to the seventh trumpet. It's on, baby. What does that mean? That means now God is moving to bring the kingdoms of the earth to himself. And what we will begin to see now is all the behind the stage of that. So interesting that he says, but in the days of the voice, in verse 7, of this angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. That which was declared to his servants and his prophets. Let's talk about this. Mystery in the Bible is not something that's a who done it. Mystery in the Bible is just something that's been concealed. Now, there are many mysteries in the Bible. The one that we know very well in this day is the mystery of the church. This cannot be what he's talking about. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers, they didn't understand that gap that God would put forth between that last week and those 69 weeks. They didn't understand about the day in which you and I live in, this day of grace. They, they were under this day of law and of prophets and all of that. They didn't understand how God was going to notch out a church and bring all the families of the earth to a position to be blessed. They wrote about it, but they didn't understand it. By this time in the book of Revelation, the church mystery has been finished. We've been raptured. Okay, so he's not talking about that. So what mystery then would God be talking about here when he sets up the kingdoms of the earth to become his kingdom? I'll tell you exactly what mystery it is. It's the mystery of every why question you've ever asked in the world. It's the mystery of why, God, would you allow the devil to do what the devil has done? Why, God, did you not just destroy the devil when he sinned in heaven? Why didn't you just annihilate him? God, why did you allow such evil upon the earth? God, why did you allow for all of this chaos and murders and sorceries? God, if you're truly God, why didn't you do it different? Okay. God says this in this chapter. When you go into the millennial kingdom, by the way, we will go, those of us that know the Lord. You will then see me. You will see how it has all unfolded. And as you look and see how all has unfolded upon the earth, why that Satan was able to do what he was able to do, why men were able to do what they were supposed to do, why there was all of this going on, you'll realize it and it will all be made known and you will give me glory. Why is that important? Here's why that's important. Because we have people on the earth now who say this. I don't want your Jesus. Don't you dare give me your Jesus. I hear this all the time. I will not believe in your Jesus. Sometimes they'll even say your GD whatever. There's no way I can receive a God who's done, who's allowed this evil. 
who's allowed this wickedness. There's no way. If there's a God, then why is there such injustice? Why is there such evil? Why is there such mistreatment? If you're, there's a God, I'm not believing in that God, okay? Right. But when you stand before him and you're brought out of hell to do that, you will realize you were wrong, not him. You will realize that he's holy and perfect and sinless. And you are a created being. See, this is why evolution is so dangerous. Evolution teaches you to exempt from creation. If you're exempt from being created by God, then you hold no allegiance. You hold no responsibility to God. If you just evolve, then you hold with allegiance within yourself. But my friend, humanity was created by God. Humanity has a responsibility to God, and humanity will stand before God. And as we think that we have no responsibility to God, then we use our own opinions to judge what's going on in the world. My friends, we are limited in our understanding, created in our being. We don't know half or a quarter of what's going on, except what the Bible tells us. And here's what the Bible tells us. Our God is perfect. The one thing about hell, it's different than earth. Your memory will be perfect. Pastor, I can't, I can't even remember anything now. Well, that's going to get fixed as soon as you die. What do you mean by that? Well, if you go to heaven, you'll be like Jesus. If you go to hell, Jesus himself said you'll be able to remember your life. When people stand before God and they want to bring up the evil of this world, here's what the angel said. When that trumpet blows and the kingdoms of earth have become the kingdoms of God, we will realize he was right He's the living God. He's perfect. And we will reckon everything he has done, and we will cry out and give him glory. So John says, the angels made this announcement. He's letting us know what's going to happen. But there's one description in the angel's hand. There's this little book. You're going to find that this little book is so important to John in his life. Verse number 2, the Bible says, and he had in his hand a little book. It was open, and that's all the th Bible says about it until John is told what to do. John is told in verse number 8 to go and get the book from the angel. In verse number 9, the angel tells John, I want you to eat the book. Now, you need to believe, you need to understand what eating was in the Bible. Eating was symbolic to believing and receiving. This is where people get mixed up when it comes to communion. Jesus said to them back then, if he that eateth and drinketh, uh, you must eat and drink my blood and my body. And they, they took it uh, as literal, but it was symbolical. Eating and drinking is a way that I consume. It's a way that I understand. It's a way that I receive. John was told to eat the little book. When you, the angel told him, now, John, when you eat the book, it's going to taste good. When you swallow it, you're going to have a bellyache. John says, well, I went and I took the book just like I was told. And, and but, man, to be honest with you, I ate that thing. It tasted like honey. As soon as I swallowed it, my belly was bitter. What's the little book, pastor? Okay. Some Bible scholars want to say that the little book is the Bible. Might be. Some Bible scholars want to go all the way back to chapter number five, and they want to say that it's, it's part of that sealed book. But that book was, was big. I want you to go to Daniel chapter 12. I think I'll show you where I, I find a Bible commentary on what this little book is. Don't miss this. You ought to write Daniel 12 down. I think you'll find the wording of this to be powerful. Daniel chapter 10, Daniel's receiving a vision here from the angel Gabriel. In Daniel chapter 10, we understand that um, God is giving him a, a vision about the end times of his people. Verse number, 11, verse number one of chapter number 12, here's what the Bible says. And at that time shall Michael, that's the archangel, stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. The, he is the uh, defender of Israel. Verse number one of chapter 12. And there shall be a time of what? Trouble. Now, anytime we refer to a time of trouble in the nation of Israel, we're talking about the great tribulation, which is the three and a half years at the, the latter part of the tribulation. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. 
Many of them, verse 2, that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. He goes on in verse 4, he says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the what? End. Now, we, we've got that phrase back in Revelation chapter 10. There shall be time no longer. He's dealing with this same part here. Watch how far the symbolism goes here. You've heard these words before. Look, if you would, at verse number five. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, one on this side of the bank of the river and on the other that side of the bank of the river. One said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand, his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever. We've read this. That it shall be for a time, times and a half, one year, two years, half a year, three and a half years. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? That's where oh my Lord came from, by the way. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. He goes on to talk about the abomination of desolation. What are we talking about here? I think we're talking about the same little book in Revelation chapter 10. This is the little book. These are the words that Daniel was given. And Daniel was told that, Daniel, there's coming a time when I'm going to deliver your people. But prior to my deliverance of your people, they're going to have trouble. Daniel read that and God said, don't you dare write it down. Don't you dare. Seal it up. I think that angel's standing there. And he's got that book, and it's a little book, not insignificant. God does nothing without significance, praise the Lord. He's got this little book, which means there's not left much to do. And Daniel takes that little book, and he eats that book, sweet in his mouth, bitter in his belly. What does Daniel understand, or what does John understand? John understands the same thing Daniel understood. That there is coming a day when the Lord Jesus is going to right every wrong. He understands there's coming a day when the nation of Israel is going to be redeemed in one moment, in one hour. But when John understood what was in that little book, and he understood what it was going to take to get to that moment, it made him sick. It made him belly bitter. I feel in my spirit a pressing for time, but I'm going to slow, and I just need to make some points. I hope you believe God hates sin. I'm not sure we understand how much God hates sin. When God judged my sin upon the Lord Jesus that day at the noon hour, he put him on the cross at 9 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, I believe the Father began to unload on the iniquity of my sin. It's from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock that you hear Jesus say things like, My God, my God, why hast thou... What did God do at 12 o'clock before he started punishing his son? What did he do to the lights? Shut them off. He didn't let anybody see what he was doing to his son. I think that's understanding because we don't understand what it took for God to judge sin. And I don't think that we understand what it's going to take in the future for God to judge sin. And God has withheld some of what he's doing. But when it unfolds in that tribulation period and the wrath of God has unfolded in vengeance against sin upon the earth, my friends, you don't want to be here. Amen. Daniel or John said, when I saw what was going to happen, I was glad that there was victory, but it was coming at a great price. Okay, let me close. Pastor, make this applicable to my life. Okay. Do you believe there's a heaven? Do you believe there's a hell? Do you believe that the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ?
Do we understand the events that are coming? What are we doing about it? Where's our bellyache? Where's our burden? Who did you tell about Christ this week? Who did you pray for? Listen, John got such a burden for what was going to happen that he couldn't hardly stomach it. I I think it's so important that churches like ours get a bellyache for people that need the gospel. We need to get burdened about this. We know the truth. We have the answer. Do you understand if your child doesn't get saved, what's going to happen to them? Do you understand what happens if your spouse doesn't get saved? Pastor, I'm praying. I'm doing all I can. Great. You're doing wonderful. You pray. Your prayers will outlast your life, and you can claim their their salvation, and I believe God will give you their salvation. But those of us that are doing nothing need to listen and understand that God is going to avenge that evil. It's time for the church to be what God wants us to be. Now we're ready for the message of the song. Would you please, Brother Rod, listen to every word and listen very carefully. So others may see the beauty and presence of your love In one who was blind but now believes Be here in my heart, flow through my blood Strengthen my soul and wash me clean A living example of what your grace has done I will walk beside you I give you my life And when others seek to find you, may I be the light that shines. Be here in my hand, give me your touch, use me to comfort and to build. Shelter for those who need your love. Breathe words to my lips. So I may speak, echo your truth and living words. Lord, make me all that I can be. I will walk beside you. Jesus, I give you my life. And when others seek to find you, may I be the light that shines. Be here in my heart, flow through my blood, strengthen my soul and wash me clean. Lord, make me all that I can be. Lord, please make me all that I can be.
all I'm trying to get us to do is understand life is great, a lot of things to be enjoyed, but we must have a spiritual focus in our life. We must have an understanding of what God wants for us to do. And our preeminence ought to be the person of Jesus Christ. Christian, you ought to have a holy life that your light may shine, that others could see the Father in you. I trust that you're living a life like that. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for the lesson today. Thank you for the message today. Thank you for the reminder today. John saw what was going to be done. It was sweet, but it was bitter. I pray today, God, that we get a glimpse of that as the church. Oh, it's sweet to know the Lord, and it's sweet what we have, but may there be a burden in our souls for others. May there be a a burden that in our own lives, that your power would be upon us, that there'd be a holiness and that there'd be a submission there. And Lord, we can only do what we, we can do. What we can do is allow you to do whatever you want to do inside of us. Stir us, God. Draw us to you. Draw us to you in faith. Draw us to you in the authority of the word of God. Draw us to you in hope, believing. I pray today, if there be anybody in this room that's not a Christian, that today... They would let us take a Bible and show them how to be saved. And today they would humble themselves and believe upon the Lord. I pray if there's any Christian here that needs to take a step of faith, that they would do it now and today and do what you'd have for them to do. Oh, the song is, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Do not pass me by. I pray that for our invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Our song of invitation is page number 489. Men of God, be here. Ladies of God, ready to pray with anyone that needs prayer. I trust that your life is a shining testimony of the grace of God, Christian. I trust that you're allowing him to make you all that he wants you to be. There's something between you and the Lord. Get it right today. Maybe you want to be saved. Come, let us take a Bible and show you how. Lift your voice now, verse 1. me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Pass me by. Let me at the throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. Save your my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. You love your preacher? I love you. Okay, close your book. No, don't close your book. Page 129. Little test. Little quiz. In your mind, put in one sentence what you learned through the message. One sentence. What did he preach on? Put in your mind one sentence. I took from that message this truth. One sentence. I'm going to ask you at the door. 
You're all going out that door, aren't you? <laughs> you don't know what door I'm going to be at. John said, it was in my mouth sweet, in my belly bitter. We have the truth. It's time to be stirred to share the truth with others. If you sat there and you can't come up with a sentence, just let that speak to you. I'll see you at the door. 129. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. Lift up your banner, let the anthems ring. Praises to our King. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty.